I have the top of the hour, so let's begin. Greetings, everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today. We have one of the best guests anybody could hope for on a topic of a great deal of interest, and I'm really looking forward to our questions, answers, and overall conversation. We've been looking at artificial intelligence and automation for several years now, and since ChatGPT was released last November, we've had three sessions on the topic, uh, and we have to have more coming up because this is a subject of a great deal of interest. It's one that seems to be having a huge, huge impact on the world. Now, there are a lot of people we could talk to about this, but the one I'd like to invite is Ruben Puentador. Um, Ruben is an education researcher, speaker, and consultant, best known for its creation of the SAMRA model, which is a framework to help educators integrate technology to teaching and learning. And throughout his career, Dr. Puentador has focused on the effective use of technology in education, now, I could say more, but I'm just reading off of what ChatGPT told me to say. Uh, I asked it to introduce Ruben, and I think it did a pretty good job. Uh, so with that note, uh, already part of me is becoming obsolete. Let me just bring um, our wonderful guest up on stage. Greetings, sir. Hi, Brian. Very How good are you doing? to join us. Good to see you. Well, I'm glad that uh, my background or my my foreground matches your background to a degree. Some blue to blue. <laughs> well, my background is part of an experiment I've been running uh, using AI, which I'll talk perhaps a little bit about later. So you, what you're seeing here, for those of you who are curious, they say, wait a second, that looks kind of like Gaudi, but it's not a like Gaudi I've ever seen. You're right. This is Gaudi you've never seen because it only exists in imaginary land, but I'll talk more about why and how and so on later. What a tease, what a tease. I can't wait to hear about that. Um, but speaking of imaginary lens, let's, uh, you know how we ask people to introduce themselves in the forum by talking about what they're working on for the next year. So what's ahead for you um, besides impressing my students, all of whom are big Samra fans? Well, thank you. I appreciate your students' uh, enjoyment of use of the Samra model. So. A couple of things, Brian. One of the aspects that I'm going to continue working on is something that, as you know, has been a focus of my work over the last few years, and that's black swans and anti-fragile thinking, particularly applied to education and educational institutions. So that's going to continue uh, looking at what happens now as, you know, if things change relative to the pandemic, but also uh, given your book coming up, uh, challenges such as those associated with climate change, challenges associated with shifts in interest and focus of students. So there's a whole world of topics there that I'm going to be looking at. But the other a key focus for me in coming months is going to be, in fact, AI. And particularly some aspects related to both generative AI, so what people look at when they look at something like a chat GPT or GPT really, uh, and uh, something like the image generation tools like Stable Diffusion, Midjourney, etc. But also other forms of AI that have more to do with how somebody can adapt uh, tools for their own purpose. And again, I can talk a little bit more about mm. that in the context of medical education uh, as it stands. But, but concretely for today's topic, you know, there are three angles from which I look at uh, uh, tools like GPT and their relatives. And one of them is to look at them from the perspective of saying, so in academia, in higher ed, what do we do with these as creative tools? How do we use them to create new things, new ideas, new objects, and so on? So that's the first one. The second one is to look at them as tools for research. And again, I can talk a bit more about this, but they can be used as tools for looking and saying, are there patterns that uh, can be that we can use the tools to dig into, to bring out that we might not have otherwise seen uh, that are important of interest that allow us again to go in new directions with research and so on. And the third direction to me is also an important one, which is what do these tools do in terms of society, societal mm -hmm. transformations, the future mm -hmm. of you know all sorts mm -hmm. of things, not just of the technology, but the future of work. And to me, just as crucially, the future of, well, how do people want to live? How would people like to live? What would, for lack of a better term, a good life be in a world where we see these tools in common use? What, what can they do that could help some of those good aspects bring into 
you know, come into being, what can they do that might block some of those aspects? You know, and how do we think about this accurately? Mm-hmm. Because uh, if there's one thing that I, you know, when people ask me, well, uh, what can we in academia do? Well, we need to be thinking about these things actively, engaging with them, you know, engaging with people in the world about them. Uh, because if not, I fear that the uh, things could go very much in the not so great direction. So I hear that. That's, well, that's on my horizon. That's quite a 12 months ahead. Um, that's an awful mm-hmm. lot on deck. Um, and friends, you can see why I had to bring Ruben on stage to, to talk about this today. Uh, I'm going to ask Ruben a couple of questions to get the ball rolling, but he's here um, for you, uh, for your questions and comments. So as we start going back and forth, please hit that Q&A box and, and type in some cues so we can prepare some A's. Um, and also, please start thinking, if you want to join us on stage, uh, you don't have to have a beard in order to be on stage, but uh, apparently it, it helps. Um, one thing that I'm, that I'm trying to figure out is when I talk to educators, they seem to have one of two basic responses. One is, this is evil and must be destroyed. Um, and, and that comes from a few different places. Uh, sometimes it's a fear of being rendered obsolete. It's a fear of cheating. Uh, sometimes it's a fear that's political, uh, that we don't trust these companies and they could be doing terrible things. And maybe part of a generalized fear of Silicon Valley. Uh, I'm, I'm compressing a lot into one stage, but that's one mentality I see. Uh, the second argues that we need to rethink a lot of our assessment. Now, I haven't heard this in terms of visuals. I only heard this in terms of text. Uh, but then the argument comes either we should remove uh, writing completely and move to, say, oral exams or air-gapped machines, or we should just rethink um, the entire apparatus of assessment. Um, if you're going to be signing papers, how do you come up with different topics? Uh, how do you, you know, do you have multiple scaffolds in order to build a system that reduces the chance of plagiarism? I, th- I think I'm seeing those two schools. You know, the first is, is, the, is that it needs to be constricted, and the second is it needs to be worked with. Um, how do you see these playing out right now in practice all around you? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I think in terms of the first school, I think there's a certain fear of, uh, you know, well, we've been doing this all along and suddenly this comes along and pretty much makes a lot of the tools we've been using useless, meaningless, etc. But to me, it's interesting how it's focused, right? When people start out with the first thing as, well, students are going to cheat. So, wow, that's the first thing you think about with your students, not what they're going to learn, not what they're going to create, not what mm. lives they want mm. to lead, not what you think about cheating. That's a kind of dark lens to look at things through. And it's not that I want to negate the, the fact that, yes, in some context, students will cheat or there is there can be encouragements for different reasons, career pressures, etc. But that to me is a weird lo- way to look at it. To me, it's a question of saying, well, OK, what can we talk about engaging students with so that the motivation for cheating is not there or so that it's irrelevant in terms of what's going on? So. If you've been doing something like assigning the standard five paragraph essay on topic X, and that's been your final form of assessment, and that's been your final form of summative assessment, and you make it a very high pressure, okay, so you, you're going to show me everything you got in this essay and so on. Well, yeah, I have, I'll tell you right now, GPT-4 just came out, I've been testing it. GPT-3.5 was still a little shaky on that. GPT-4 is very good. I have to say, at constructing a standard five-paragraph essay given a topic and a little bit of coddling along the way. So in theory, you could say, yeah, sure, uh, that's going to be what students are going to do. But you have to be asking the question, why were you asking the students to do this in the first place? Right? And if you were doing this as summative assessment, as a way of saying, hey, what have you learned? The truth is, this is a really bad tool for that because all it generally is doing is asking students to rehash something that they got. And guess what? Yeah, a tool like a large language model like a GPT-4 is excellent at rehashing things and will only get better with time. So you're asking your students to perform a task that, frankly, a machine, as we're seeing, can get better and better at doing. Mm-hmm. But if the reason you were asking your students to write essays was to say, well, look, there are some things I would like my students to have at the front of their mind. So this is a way to get them to put it at the front of their mind. 
I wanted to do it as a way of, you know, if I ask them to put things together, can I gauge their understanding how that's coming together and so on? Again, as a form of formative assessment for which there will be a feedback loop and so on. Then suddenly two things happen. Number one, the incentive to cheat or the worry that people have tends to recede into the background. Why? Because this is not anymore a kind of, this is the sole thing I will judge you on, but more a question of, listen, I want to see where you're at, how your thoughts are evolving. I will give you a tool for analyzing, examining your own thinking. Then there's not much motivation for cheating. You start to take away the motivation. And number two, the other thing you can start thinking is about, well, saying, well okay, absent a tool like GPT, I could assign this writing, but can I change how I do writing with GPT and similar tools in the middle so I get at richer things? So I might ask my student, for instance, instead of writing the standard five paragraph essay, by the way, I've never liked the five paragraph form, but we'll save that for another time. Uh, I can say, well, okay, let's engage with a topic and let's have the student engage with it using GPT to bring together some arguments, but to go beyond those arguments. So what I'm asking the student is, yes, I'm still asking them to thread together ideas, but I'm giving them, if you will, a partner in construction. Mm. Of that. And this is something mm. we're just, let me be very clear, we're, we're learning how mm. to do that. As the tool evolves, as the tool becomes more mm. useful, etc., we can start doing richer, more interesting things. So just between uh, GPT-3.5 and GPT-4, the world has changed in terms of what I can ask my students to engage with. So I can ask GPT to give me a brief summary of the thinking of philosopher X, right? So uh, I can ask it to tell me, well, uh, tell me what, for instance, Gadamer might have said about this, or uh, you know, tell me what the, you know, the following school of uh, continental thought as compared to this uh, school of Anglo thought mindset. That's easy. That You can get that. But then you can have your students start to interplay with that in ways that do not go to what something like GPT can easily do. And do tell me, does the student understand how this thinking occurs? Does the student understand how to put it together, how to synthesize mm. something mm. from it? Mm. So that's, I think, where I would address that first school, if you will, the, the negative one. And as, and as you can see, it's closer to the viewpoint of the second school, right? But I also have a comment to make in the context of the second school. And that is, as I said, we're just learning how to use these tools. And to me, it's important that we not lock ourselves into what I would call sub-optimal ways of using the tool. What do I mean by this? I'm seeing already a rush to saying, oh, we have these tutorial models that we developed using some type of scaffolded uh, platforms, whether it's Khan Academy or another one. And now we can use a tool like GPT-4 to provide directed instruction by engaging with the student in a dialogue about what they understand, what they don't understand. Now that in first instance would be indeed an improvement, okay? In summer terms, an augmentation over yes. what was being done because it is responsive to the student to a certain degree. But my question is, we want to be careful because I don't want to get locked in and say, well, okay, so what I did is I enhanced that mode of instruction and that's it. But what about constructing a whole new platform that mm. could not be constructed mm. without this type of tool that goes beyond what you could do with the type of, you know, standard presentation, video plus uh, quiz uh, structure with some type of responsive structure, etc. You know, which, it, if I have to be perfectly frank, hasn't evolved that much other than in terms of software technology on top of it since the 50s. In other Ooh. words, so for, for the positive aspects, what I would encourage us to try to do is to think deeply about saying, well, when you have a tool with this type of plasticity, with this type of power, with this type of possible uses. Can we take a step back and say, well, we could enhance one of our existing tools. And maybe we start there because that's fine, but we don't just say, and now we call it the day and we're all done. I would encourage us again, Samar terms to push to the modification to redefinition levels where you're doing something that you couldn't do without the tool. Cool. 
Well, that's an excellent, excellent answer. You, you remind me late last night, I was a little tired. I asked uh, GPT-4 to create a synthesis of the political philosophies of Enver Hoxha, the Albanian Marxist, and Henry George, an American 19th century economist, and then to do so in the style of the Marx brothers. And uh, it, it did a pretty good job. It did a pretty good job. It really synthesized uh, all of that together. Um, but, um, but, you know, that was, but we need to have that, that creation, that sense of co-creation and redesign for something that we couldn't do before. Now, we have more questions piling up and I was gonna ask you another one, but I, I think I, I, wanna, I wanna open the floor here. Uh, we have one from uh, Kate Herzog. Hello, Kate. And uh, Kate says, if AI is to be part of our education, do you see institutional schools as negotiating group subscriptions? So all teachers and students have equal access to those today? The library and wonders. Okay, excellent question. The answer, short answer, yes. Long answer, yes, yes, yes. Okay, <laughs> by all means. In other words, we need to have equity of access to these tools. And that's very important. Equity means, of course, uh, covering that cost of subscription, through libraries, through, you know, whichever, so we say front end for education we're looking at, uh, those need to be there. It can't be the case that if you can afford the $20 per month, you get the good GPT access, and if you can't afford the $20 per month, you get to this answer brought to you by fill in the blank of your favorite mm -hmm. uh, ad buyer for the day, who will proceed to customize the answer for your terms, right? So we need, equity, but I want to emphasize that equity needs to stretch beyond just, okay, so we all have this uh, type of, you know, it's not a burden based on economic terms uh, to gain access to this. You also need to be talking about equity in terms of access to what you can do with the tool. Because I want mm. to emphasize something in terms of what you can do right now. Right now, everybody has access to at least uh, chat GPT 3.5, right? And you have access to Bing's own interface, whatever Microsoft ultimately decides. Well, let's call it Bing Bot for now. But that's it. Then pay twenty dollars and you get access to ChatGPT four, and we'll see how that evolves over time. And you have fewer limits on time, what you can ask, the depth, how deep a conversation you can have, and so on. And then pay per token with a developer's license, and you have access to the engine itself. And now I can start doing things that I cannot do through. Uh, chat GPT. For instance, some of the research I do in terms of exploring patterns that emerge from text uh, cannot be done easily with chat GPT. You get uh, the chat GPT interface gets in the way. I need to be able to ask and say, here's a huge volume of text Classify it this way. But if I do it in the interactive chat GPT way, it's going to take me five months to complete it. If I can just pay per token, I just say, boom, just do this whole thing give it back to me in a file when you're done and we're all set. And that's what I mean by equity of access. In other words, we need our students to be able to access on all of these terms because otherwise, ChatGPT, don't get me wrong, it's a wonderful front end, but it is a front end with mm -hmm. certain assumptions, certain limitations, certain conditions imposed upon it, some of which may make sense for an educational audience, some of which may not. And again, if we don't allow that fuller access through our institutions, through whatever media we choose to provide access to, then we immediately create an, uh, a situation where there is no equity of access and you get into very, very different uh, conditions of how you can use, how you can think, how you can create with the tool. So I, I think that's a crucial point. Well, that, that wasn't the direction I thought you would go in, and it's a great one. Uh, and Kate Herzog, thank you for the superb question. Um, friends, you can see that, uh, that Ruben will be very kind to you, um, and, uh, and this is a great place for you to put forth your questions and comments. Uh, we have a few more coming up, uh, and this is one coming from uh, Ranjana Dutta. Oh, Ranjana, I hope I haven't totally butchered your name. Um, this has to do with, I have got creative data and references. I would worry about them using ChatGPT as a partner to build on right now. How can we verify information without having the teachers do that? Uh, 
are we, Rajal, could you clarify for me a little bit more? Uh, when you're talking about verifying information, are you talking about verifying whether a student has used uh, chat GPT or are you talking about whether a body of information is sourced that then a student will then be using using chat GPT? I want to make sure I understand your question correctly. Uh, Ranjana, please feel free to type in a follow-up question to clarify that. And of course, if you want to just talk out loud, just you know, hit the raise hand button and we'll beam you up on stage. Um, thank you. And while Ranjana is, is wrestling with that, uh, we have a question um, uh, from John Hollenbeck. Uh, John, I hope you're staying warm. Um, and John asks, why is it we hardly blinked over tools like Grammarly, which passively edits student essays? You know, John, that's a great question. And I have to be honest with you. I think it's a question. Um, I, I don't know the answer to the why uh, explicitly, other than to say that I think the tools merged enough with what we already had that we didn't really pay attention or that much of academia didn't pay attention to what the tool could do or would do. In other words, you have a, you know, say, well, a spell checker. A spell checker is like looking up in a dictionary. And the grammar checker sounds like the same thing, except it's not, of course, right? It starts to get into the structure of communication, the structure of how students talk or what uh, students, have, the structures that students use to communicate and so on. But it was proximal enough to the spell checker that we accepted. But that being said and done, you're right. It, it went largely unexamined and it should have been. And again, uh, one of the things you can do, of course, with GPT, particularly GPT-4 is superb. If you give it the sentence that's, eh, and you say, can you make this clearer? Can you make this better grammatically and so on? It nails it, no question about it. But, but then we, again, get into a question of, okay, so rather than talking about grammar and does a student have good grammar, bad grammar, or however you choose to phrase it, uh, can we talk about, well, why? Are we concerned about grammar and can we instead talk more a little bit more deeply about communication meaning creation and how the tool can be used for that because a lot of the old grammar tools of course my favorite was they either had an obsession with the passive voice mm -hmm. a, it was nothing may ever be in the passive voice okay it's not I, bad i agree with that yeah i agree overuse of the passive voice but all oh, right uh or they would be obsessed with latinate forms or you know mm -hmm. they, whoever wrote the tool had some obsession typically and some of these were primitive forms of expert systems in ai it depends on which one you were looking at how it worked right but again with a gpt4 you have something that's much more plastic you're not it, it isn't going to force you into just this or that you can instead query and say well for this type of audience in this type of context how might I best convey this? And for instance, uh, Brett, one of the points that I think is crucial to the work you're doing with academia and climate change, a lot of the climate change reports, a lot of the climate change documents are deep, they are rich, they have important information. But let's face it, not everybody has the time to read several thousand pages worth of report. Even the executive summary can be 40 pages or more of dense stuff. And I can use GPT to say, hey, just take this, summarize it, and I'm not just going to say, and now just spit it out, right? But I can use it to say, contextualize it for a given audience, help me communicate. And of course, a student can use it for themselves, saying, okay, I don't get this. Can you help me by explaining, reframing, etc." So if you will, we're now taking the old grammar checking tool, the old grammar checking task, and making it a richer task of communication. I had a I had a very cynical reading myself on that, which was that uh, Grammarly didn't threaten journalists, um, but ChatGPT scares them. Uh, Shin Li in the chat had a, a much more uh, uh, thoughtful response, which is that uh, in her understanding, uh, ChatGPT is not bound up to a particular academic discipline, so everybody can feel challenged by it. Um, Thank you, Ruben, for that great, great answer. Uh, I wanted to circle back to uh, Ranjana, uh, who had her question before, and let's see if we can bring her up on stage. Hello. Hey, Ranjana, welcome. Hello, hello. Um, yes, this is very interesting. Thank you for answering the questions. And I'm one of those, I like to take light for what it is and try to go from wherever we are. And um, I was just verifying this for my own sake putting in some questions and getting um, references to see what comes through. And many, if not, like I asked for 10 references on a topic of first generation college students that I was interested in. 
and it showed up with a number of references. I think about nine of the 10 given were wrong. Um, mm -hmm. They were literally um, amalgamations with similar sounding names, similar sounding titles, very creatively done, but none of them authentic. I couldn't find them anywhere. And what I would worry about as a teacher, A, this is not what a teacher would be doing is verifying mm -hmm. your references. Um, B, students don't, I mean, especially current, current state of the science or state of the world is they don't want to start in time to do the things that they need to do for their mm -hmm. papers. So it's usually being done last minute. So they're not mm -hmm. going to verify this. And if you're going to build on things that you don't even know where they came from, it becomes very problematic. So I would, at this time, I'm Thanks hoping so. future versions may get us to that point where we can do those kinds of things. So that was my concern at this time when you had said that we can, you know, use it as a partner. I would love to, but given what I saw, I was right. just like, eh, I can't go that road. Right. Let me, that's a very, okay, thank you. That makes it very clear and you're absolutely right. So let's, let's be clear one very important thing. We have to also be very aware of the limitations of the tool as it exists right now. And you mentioned one of the key ones, right? If you take just ChatGPT, even four, and ask it to provide references for something, it will tend to do uh, after a certain point what sometimes is called hallucinate. In other mm -hmm. words, it creates a new reference and people say, why is it making up a reference? You have to understand a little bit how uh, the whole GPT ensemble, all la large language model tools work. What they're doing is they're finding patterns, right? And initially you'd say, well, it found a pattern and the pattern included as part of that pattern where the pattern was sourced. The trouble is the larger and the more complex the model becomes, the harder it is to keep those references in there. In fact, at some point you have to give up the exact references. So you can do something that would be the equivalent of, this is an approximate, but almost an, exact, an exercise in recall. I know this is generally true, and I think I saw it there. The trouble is, at some point it starts matching patterns to a there that never existed. It's a little bit as though you said, you know, I know I heard that, it must have been my friend Freddy. Actually, Freddy never said that. But you say, it must have been my friend Freddy, because in your mind you matched it to this. And one thing I always try to emphasize is, please, uh, the large language models don't even remotely think like a human being does. These are large pattern discovery and pattern matching generation engines. So how do you solve this? Well, the way in which you solve it is you say, look, the large language model works like a reasonable human being might be in terms of its capacity to have a general body of knowledge to interpret things. And that has been growing from model to model. And then for things like references, it has to build upon another body of references, just like you would go and look it up in your library. So you said, instead of saying, I think Freddie told me this, you'd say, let me go to my bookshelves or my virtual bookshelves now, or whatever, you know, my, a Google Scholar, et cetera, and make sure I'm remembering correctly where it is. That is where the GPT family is going right now. And you see some of that in BingBot, okay? If you use the Bing, a engine, it will give you references, and those references are legit. I have not had, I've not been able to make the Bing bot hallucinate. I have been able to make it lose its place, but I have never, I have not yet, that doesn't mean it can't be done, uh, been able to have it generate a complete link to a website that doesn't exist. It links to website. However, however, Bing bot is still very primitive because the quality of the reference websites it links to is varies very wildly with respect to the question, even when better websites exist. So for instance, I ran a test on something that would be of interest to any student or fact, in fact, any member of the community who was interesting, interested in a, something relative to environmental uh, rules and protection of the environment in the community and so on. And I felt I could get Bing to give me a good answer okay. and give me references, but the references were to low quality okay. sources. Hmm. Uh, and it's an interesting question why they got ranked. We, we could get to it. I did an analysis later for which ones showed up and why, et cetera. It was fairly good. You know, it was well beyond what most people would want to do. But again, the, the team is aware of this. There, I, I suspect what we're going to see at some point is a an option to say, well, I would like to have it point towards this set of sources or to fine tune 
my sources. So that, for instance, in this particular case, even though government websites, EPA websites, uh, organizations devoted to protection of a particular species or environment all existed, it was going to, as I say, very, very low, you know, a third tier sources and so on. So that still needs to be fine tuned and needs work on. So that's a very long answer. I apologize uh, for that to no your worries. point, which is to say that at this point, would I tell students to go out and get sources, references from GPT? No. But what I might do is to say instead, okay, so here's a topic. You have, I give you the references or you find the references and then you use GPT to help you analyze or understand these references. So that's where I would do it. I would not at this point, even with GPT or chat GPT-4, give it that task because the hookup to sources is not yet refined enough. I hope it will be, and I'm hoping it will be fine tuned. So, yeah, that, that, was, that would be that exactly at this point. my concern. Was that not only were the and I don't, I'm not an AI person at all. I'm a psychologist, and I was looking at oh. what has what it produced were also even the ideas where some of them were amalgamations. I happen to know some of the mm. people who are in the field. Right. And mm -hmm. I'm like, if if somebody cited this about my work, I would be up in arms because I never said that. But it's like similar people might have said something similar. And there was that sort of amalgamation that had me rather concerned. Like, it's not just that it's creating these websites and they look very good. I, I use APA format and they were in APA format and everything with right. DOIs. And it was all like literally fake. Yeah. So. Right. That's and like I, hallucination. And as I say, no, no, it's, it, that's exactly it. It's important to realize that that is a limitation of the technology right. as it is implemented in ChatGPT. And as I say, the crudeness of the approach so far in being GPT. But since you brought this up, there's one more aspect, and I suspect Brian thought I was going to mention this earlier, so I'll mention it now, which is that all of these are commercial efforts, and all of them are associated in one way or another with advertising, the sale of advertising, the sale of a, a platform, a voice to somebody that wants to sell a product, get a particular message out, and so on. We can work with them as we have all along. That's not anything new. But I would also like to see in parallel, particularly for those of us in academe, what are open source slash, you know, to use the European term, Libre efforts develop in AI. Because I think it's going to be crucial for multiple reasons. A, number one, the more engines there are out there, the better, the more richly, the more interestingly, I think the field will develop. Number two, if having an engine I can look at and look at the source code and look at the body of uh, references material it was trained upon and to say, oh, I see this working, not working because of this, and I can make sure that I can answer, you know, why, why did this happen? Well, I, and I can do more and say, well, that's in the general pattern of hallucination. I can say, well, geez, let me see, because I have the tools to dig specifically into why this particular failure occurred or this particular thing occurred is I think also crucial. So I don't view this as a uh, optional thing. I do view the development of open source Libre AIs as a necessary component as we move forward for again, full use of this in academe and for all frankly addressing some of the challenges and potential risks of the existing engines. So that's I think one more point that emerges from what you've brought up. So thank you again for bringing up that point. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Professor Duta. And uh, please stay warm if you're in Saginaw. I hope it's uh, warm and sunny. Yes, thanks. <laughs> Friends, um, that's an example of a video question. And we now have another example of a video question. Uh, just to show you our geographical reach, we are now going to bring on stage uh, a wonderful professor from uh, our media. Uh, this is Brent Anders, who's been uh, on our stage before. Brent is doing tremendous work on uh, talking about ChatGPT his Twitter feed is admirable, and his videos are just essential. Brent, welcome. Thank you, Brian. Hi, Brent. OK, so I have a, a couple of uh, different comments, so I'll try to be quick. The first yes. thing is the whole idea with the hallucinations. Yeah, that's a, that's a big deal. 
um, the GPT-4 is supposed to be 40% better, uh, but the hallucinations are still there, right? So now it's, it's a little bit above 80% where it's going to be right. And then there's still around 15 to 20% where there's a problem. So, but given that, uh, one of the big things that I'm always pushing for all my instructors, every speech when I talk about ChatGPT is this idea of AI literacy, of knowing that, hey, it could be wrong. So critical thinking is very important. That means that we have to analyze any response, but that should go without saying. I mean, you're a subject matter expert, but I'm not just taking what you're saying as dogma, right? I still have to critically analyze. But going back to what you just talked about with, um, uh, with, with the professor that was just talking there, the psychology professor, so what I've been recommending, and this is kind of unique, I guess, is um, to, to I have a lot of instructors that teach freshman seminars. So that's all writing, you know, having to know all the different techniques here. What I've been recommending to them is this idea of, well, one of the big things, if you happen to have used ChatGPT, which, of course, it's, it's a, the, the instructor is allowed to let them use it. It's their choice. We're very flexible with that here at my university. But the word I've been recommending to them, because I'm very much into role play, right? I think that's how students really learn. So I, I tell them this. You need to increase this idea of how severely wrong it would be to have some sort of refer reference in any essay, in any article that's wrong or made up. So now what I tell them is that this is exactly what I would do is a student submits a paper. And then I would say this, if, they, if there was a, an incorrect made up reference, I would stop the class and say, you know, come up. You're now gonna have to go in front of a board because what you committed was something that's extremely bad. It, it's not just like, oh, you made a mistake. No, you created something wrong. So that means that you didn't do your due diligence and you just lost credibility in the field. Wow, this is a major thing. This isn't some minor problem. This is, wow, you're probably not going to be able to present at conferences anymore. You're not going to be able to be published anymore. This is a major deal. And again, to role play it out so that they have this emotional connection as opposed to, well, I'm just going to use ChatGPT and turn it in because I, I'm trying to save time. So again, whatever we can do to really connect some emotion to the process, that's where we're going to make a lot of gains because that learning process needs to have some emotional connection in order for it to really be retained and to really sink in. So that would be my little recommendation for, for that last incident. But let me get to my question, right? So with the GPT-4 that came out, OpenAI also released an article to help explain GPT-4. And interestingly enough, in their article, they had a whole section there talking about the dangers of over-reliance on any AI model. And it was very interesting because they talked about some of the big dangers of if we start to use AI for all these other tasks that will you know, save us time, we're going to actually start to lose skills, which makes a lot of sense. But it's this balance of what we have to do. Because uh, on the same day that I read that and I, I just released a video talking about the dangers of that, Microsoft just came out with their big presentation talking about Microsoft 365 Copilot. Yeah, and what is it going to do? It's going to totally change how we do work so that you have a reliance on them to do so much of your in-between work. Summarize this for me. Give me drafts really quickly, which is great. I mean, I'm all about productivity. So my question to you then is, what do you see as the proper balance and how do we express that in the best way to our students to get them to ensure that they have fundamental skills, but then also be able to properly use the AI because that's going to be required in whatever job they go into because that's the new reality. But they still, if they if they lose that fundamental skill, they're going to be able, they're not going to be able to be as effective with that AI and they'll start to lose what right actually looks like. So I'm really interested in your thoughts on that. And if you've given any thoughts as to how we might approach that, because this AI literacy thing to me, it seems like this is what we need to be pushing for in academia as far as mm, mm. the way things were a, a couple of years ago when, oh, the term critical thinking, yeah, that has to be part of every single class. That has to be part of, I see it, AI literacy as the new critical thinking. I mean, critical thinking is part of that, but right. 
AI literacy, I see that as being a necessity, an SLO part of every single class from now on because it's so important. All right, that's it. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That's a great question. And uh, I, I agree wholeheartedly that it is crucial. I mean, absolutely crucial to get that type of critical relationship to AI. And this is something actually, even before the large language models I've been working on for quite some time, which is where I get people to try to think of these tools shouldn't be a replacement for your thinking. They shouldn't be a replacement for what you make, how you act. They should be a tool in your tool set. For getting at this and the example i, I used uh, i'll go on a slight tangent here because this is a different model from gpt uh but when ibm was pushing watson and mm -hmm. watson for medicine in particular they were talking about and then watson is going to come in and it's going to interpret all of these things for you and the implication was always and you don't need that silly doctor in the middle and what i would always point out is to say that look i don't have the budget that ibm does for watson but I could, on a rather beat up little old laptop, uh, I've since upgraded my machine, but this is right before the pandemic, I had a laptop that was already pretty beat up and a few years old. And I could show how by using some uh, a AI tools for image recognition, I say very primitive compared to what you're looking at with the large language models and so on, but very specialized, very focused on how, for instance, you read an X-ray, say, you work in this region. This region has a problem, for instance, with MDR, XDR, so multiple drug resistant, extensive, uh, extensive drug resistant tuberculosis, right? And what you have then is a scenario where your patients don't look like a generic patient. So you can work with the AI to train it to your needs. And now you working with this can do triage. You can say right away, okay, given the analysis, this person clearly doesn't have TB. Or given the analysis, this person clearly has TB. And then working together, you can focus on, okay, this is the tricky case. And that's the type of thinking. So I was doing that, as I say, prior to the pandemic, working on different scenarios with the idea that, no, you don't have to buy the big model. And in fact, you can do better than buying the big model if instead you focus on this type of thinking alongside the AI with it as a tool, focusing on those cases that the work together, so to speak, in a certain sense, gives you a better result than you could get from each chunk on its own. And that goes to the heart of what you're saying, because it's exactly the same situation now with GPT, or for that matter, with some of the uh, image generation models, right, like uh, stable diffusion. And to say, so how can I work together with this? And this is where we need to work with our students. And again, we're, we're making this up as we go along. So please understand, I don't have a huge list of, you know, and here are 10,000 examples, and here's the book, you can go out and buy it tomorrow, etc. No, we're inventing right now the examples where we say, look, here's where you using ChatGPT can do something that ChatGPT can't do on its own. You can do on your own, but look at what happens when you have the synergy of the two components and what do you need to know for that synergy to be effective, which goes to your point, right? And make sure, but we need to create those examples. So you mentioned something earlier, which I think is also an excellent arena. And I know, in fact, all three of us now on stage, I know are interested in it, which is the whole arena of what you do with games, role-playing and games. And for instance, if you look at the guest brand that you had on uh, your forum in terms of uh, the whole, concept of teaching history via role playing with reacting to the past RTD. Mm -hmm. Mark Carnes, yes. Exactly. And one of the things you can do there is you can say, well, can I use ChatGPT to generate what would what might have been a speech by fill in the blank of, you know, whoever in where, whatever location. So let's uh, pretend this is a speech by Danton, right? Uh, made to a oh, crowd as uh, you know, seeking support, et cetera. And then ask a student, okay, now critique it. Hmm. Why would you find this persuasive or non-persuasive? What about you constructing your speech? Okay, now let's have this play out in the role play with your fellow students. Which one of these works, which one doesn't? Why? What does this tell you about history? What does this tell you about motivation? How would you go about finding more data to make your speech even more persuasive? How would you go about as a historian 
right? Researching the period and what could you use from GPT, but what is not there from GPT that you need to bring to the table? How does this influence what you need to know, what you need to learn? So again, I think we need to create this type of experience, but it really very much needs to be something where the students have their hands in the actual machine, for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. uh, so they can experiment and feel for themselves, if you will, what's working, what's not working, and where they're going to need to. I, I like that. So it's more of a, this dynamic assessment, more of a skills right. application. So we're talking about less writing of, let's say, essays to explain what I know and more opportunity to actually engage and utilize my skills to prove that I can actually go through it, I can actually do it. So simulations would be a great example of that, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So thank you. Thank you. That, that, that's a great thank point. You. Thank you very much. Brent, that's great commentary uh, and a great question. Uh, friends, we're, we're running low uh, on time. Uh, so I want to make sure that we get in some of the biggest questions. Um, and we're going, if you'd like, uh, we can also publish the unasked, uh, unaddressed questions uh, to my blog, uh, as soon as we get the recording up. Uh, we have one question from uh, our good friend, uh, George Station, uh, who circles back to the question of business and uh, to the question of privacy as well. Related to equity, should we expect our students and ourselves to keep feeding ChatGPT for corporate gain? a la Turnin and others, is that a fair trade-off? Great question, George. And again, this is one of those places where I think we need to push for transparency, as much transparency as possible from everybody involved here. So to, to your point, as far as I can tell right now, given the contracts, given the licensing agreements, yes, I've done the boring job of reading through the licensing agreements in detail. Is, mm. Isn't that fun? And I'm mm. not a lawyer, nor do I play one on TV. If, if I did, I'd play Perry Mason. That would be at least more fun. Uh, but uh, anyhow, but the point is, as far as I can tell right now, uh, the GPT family, whether it's three, five or four, is not being trained on materials that we're submitting. ChatGPT and Bing GPT themselves, so the interface may be a different story. And that's a very good question. In other words, do we have full knowledge of how much input is being used, how it's being used? I'd like more clarity myself. And I think that's something that, uh, I'm gonna be honest with you, I, I don't think it's the sort of thing that I am expecting Microsoft to say, and here you go, everything uh, for you, I suspect we're going to have to go and say, hey, if you want us to you know, use this, we need to talk about what these conditions are. And again, here is where having Libre tools becomes once again, a key component. Because one of the things that is, if, if the only choice you have is Bing, uh, Bing bot, okay, uh, then, yeah, you ask all you like, but it's either that or nothing. And particularly since Bing bot appears to be poised to become the major interface uh, to all of the search mm -hmm. engine for Bing, mm -hmm. you might, so, but if on the other hand, you can say, well, no, hold on, I'm just going to go here where I do know the conditions. I do know the tool set and you know, I'll be honest with you, some of the Libre efforts are very far along too. So it's not like you're saying, well, here's GPT-4 and the Libre efforts are years behind. I'd say uh, some of them are very close and at comparable level. So this is the point at which you can say, we all have, you know, I, the greater diversity of tools, the better, but there needs to be transparency in terms of how this is being used mm -hmm. and why. So. Yeah, I think it's let's, an important question to ask. Let's let's take this in a slightly different direction. Uh, we've been talking about ChatGPT producing texts uh, and you know, producing papers, producing answers, and co-producing for us. Um, but the tool is actually much stranger and much deeper than that. Um, here's a question that uh, I'd like to chime in on myself, actually. Uh, this is from Robert uh, Fentress, uh, who says, have you tried GPT-4's new Socratic tutor system? Uh, it's quite impressive. 
Uh, and he also shared a link uh, to some examples, which I will now put in the chat for everyone to uh, get a chance to play with. Uh, the part I wanted to chime in with was um, I followed a, a Wharton University professor to coax ChatGPT into serving as a game master uh, for a simulation and found that enormously successful uh, and, and very positive. That, that, that kind of role, that uh, strong interlocutor, seems very different from ChatGPT as a text generator. Uh, what do you think about this part? It's an incredibly rich uh, aspect, and you're right. It's a very different use of the pattern engine than what you have when you're just using it for text generation. And that, that's part of the beauty of large language models, right? This starts to get at some of the directions for research that I was talking about and for expanding the range of what can happen. Because one of the interesting things is, yes, I have played a little bit with the Socratic tutor as well. It is very intriguing. You know, I, I have to, I, have, I haven't pushed it quite yet as hard as I'd like. So I've just begun to push it, but, uh, but it is very intriguing and it speaks to possibilities that are to go to one of the things I was talking about earlier, not locking ourselves into old forms of instruction mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, with just an enhancement from the tool to say, well, what can we do where a student can use the tool to get better insight into their own patterns of thinking? to get better mm -hmm. insight into how they might think, what they might construct and so on. So those are possibilities. And it's very interesting too, to see uh, when you start pushing uh, GPT-4 in these directions just a little bit, to see where it starts almost, for lack of a better word, and I, I know what's going on at a mechanical level, but let's metaphorically say, it's almost like it's reaching and saying, well, clearly I didn't reach quite far enough in the patterns. Let me pull this in as well. So it starts to speak to very much a model that can start very focused on, okay, I have an immediate issue here that I need help thinking through and so on. But it builds out a scaffolding and it's not a pre-established scaffolding that I pre-designed, right? What I call sometimes the abuse of Vygotsky and frameworks, etc. It is rather a scaffolding that is helping the student explore new directions. And, and that's new. In other words, that is really something that we haven't had tools for. So this is an area both for research, exploration, personal development. And again, I emphasize we're at the beginnings of this. We all need to just start working on it with an open mind and also know that we're going to come into points where we're going to say, oh, wait, no, that, that didn't work. Fine. So how do we fix? How do we reroute? And so on. But I agree. It, it's a fascinating direction and very different from if connected to the write the paper or, you know, summarize this or extract this information for me, et cetera. Very good, very good. Uh, we have time for one more question, which is on a, another angle again, and this is from our good friend, uh, Charles Finley uh, from Northeastern, who asks this simple but uh, major question. What happens to copyright and publishers in this new era? <laughs> oh boy, uh, huge question, uh, Charles. I don't know the full answer, but let me tell you one of the things I think we need to do. We need to take a step back. Speaking of, just like I say, take a step back from how we've been teaching and say, hey, can we come up with a whole new approach here? We need to do something likewise with copyright. Because one of the problems is we've gotten down a set of rabbit holes, for lack of a better term, with copyright, which becomes, say, well, it's the life of the author plus so many years. Oh, is that too many years? Is that too few years? And does this corporation own the rights? And does this person retain the rights? When do the rights revert? You know, we, we get into a whole business of copyright as a whole system of ownership. And it is that, a mistake. But we've lost sight of the purpose of copyright. And this is where I'm going to suggest that we need to go back to the ideas of copyright. And yes, uh, pull out the quote from Jefferson, but it's not just Jefferson, plenty of other thinkers at the time before, <laughs> during and after have weighed in on the topic with nuances, complexities, You know, who gets to have access to on what, for what reason. But the idea that ultimately the goal of copyright is not just to protect ownership period, which is I fear what sometimes it gets constructed as, but to provide a scaffold for building upon. So I think we're going to need to start rethinking aspects of copyright in this age. And it comes up, you see behind me an image, okay? This is from experiments I've been doing on learning spaces and thinking about them using Gaudi's approach to architecture. And many of you may not know this, but Gaudi designed the school and it's one of the most beautiful spaces 
I've seen conceptually, even though sadly I've never seen it in action because it got made into offices years and years ago. But there's a whole series of ideas. There's the idea of solar power, of how we use solar energy. So there's a bit of solar punk in here as well. Mm. Idea of open, joyful spaces for creation by learners. So, so I've been playing with uh, the engine. This is uh, with stable diffusion to generate not one, not two, but literally thousands of variants on this idea to help me think through the process. Okay, but stable diffusion was trained on a ton of images, many and many and many of which are in fact under copyright, owned by an artist, owned by a corporation, owned by somebody. And the question is, well, none of those images subsist in the set. So it's a lot more like somebody going to a museum and getting a lot of ideas from what they see around them and then summarizing them. But at the same time, I don't want to say that you can just go in and say, well, just because of that, then there's no giving back. How, how do we weigh this? How do we weigh, you know, matrices of how we think about what copyright is, what copyright might be, that allow us to get the richness that makes something like this possible, but without starving, frankly, every artist that might be producing art out there and recognizing that they need to eat they need to make a living and they have a right to their art also continue to be recognized as something of their own with a voice of their own. So the answer to your question is, it's a great question. And I think we need to think about it, but at a very deep level, not just at the, what judge do we send this to or how many more years do we add or subtract to copyright? Well, thinking at a deep level is what you've had us doing nonstop for the past hour, Ruben. And I, I thank you very, very much for it. But the hour has passed, and I'm afraid I have to wrap things up. Uh, thank you for, for that answer to that great question, Charles. Ruben, you've been fantastic. What's the best way to keep up with your thoughts on AI? Right now, the best way to find me is once upon a time, I would have said Twitter, but Twitter has been a bit unreliable of late. It still is Ruben RP, and I'll continue using it so long as it can more or less be used uh, mechanically. But I'm also, as Ruben Quint Durham on uh, LinkedIn, and you can find my blog at hippasus.com slash blog. And I'm also posting on there. Uh, last but far from least, I also work with Arizona uh, with the Shaping EDU project at ASU. And some of my work is also in that context. So a bit, I, I, I will admit it, a little bit, uh, this, you know, disseminated in different places, but any and all of those uh, should give you access to the work I'm doing these days. Well, everyone we should pay attention to that, follow that, and he did. Uh, and Ruben, we're gonna have to bring you back once uh, we get the ChatGPT version nine, um, so we can, we can <laughs> see where that goes. Uh, thank you so much. And, uh, and thanks to everybody for your great questions and comments. Uh, I'm gonna share, that we have a, a raft of questions uh, that we didn't get a chance to go to because the subject is so huge. Uh, so we're going to try and save those and post them to the blog so people can access them. Um, in the meantime, if you'd like to keep up with us, uh, please use the hashtag FTTE on Twitter or on Mastodon or wherever you like. Uh, looking ahead, we have some sessions coming up on a wide range of topics. Uh, if you, uh, We also if, have all the archive available if you'd like to go back into our previous sessions, including our ones on AI. Um, Above all, thanks everybody for wrestling with this great, great issue together. Uh, I'm so excited to see all of these great minds thinking together to try to work our way to the best possible way forward. Um, everyone take care. I hope springtime for those of you in the Northern Hemisphere is coming to you very sweetly. I hope everyone is safe and we'll talk to you next time online. Bye-bye. <laughs>